Hi, my name is Molly Carmichael Bazanda, and this podcast series is a conversation with the industry's most inspirational leaders building the future of our communities, the places we love to visit, and ultimately where we all call home. I love the design and development business and all that goes into creating a new place. It's really interesting, and I think you'll find it interesting too. I've had the pleasure and great fortune to work with so many of these amazing leaders and their teams on my travels over the last 25 plus years. And so we're gonna talk to the industry's best, the brightest, and truly the most inspirational people behind the scenes, creating those places and spaces that are most important to you, or they will be one day. It's fascinating to think that their legacy will live on for hundreds and hundreds of years. So before we start the interview, I thought we'd just share a little bit about the process and everything really starts with the land. And then they look at the history and then they sit down with people and they really want to understand and they combine the dreams really of how many of you want to live. And from there, a team of people join together and they build that extraordinary place first on paper. And then of course it goes on from there. But the key things they're looking at is where the land and the opportunities can really come together and create those special places. And then from there, the adventure begins. And more importantly, Every great development starts with people, and they're really designing for every generation with really also the same goal in mind, and that's to make a difference today and for those future generations to come. And with any luck, those places turn into a place to dance, and they've got uh, all kinds of fun things going on in the community centers to celebrate. They're working with the schools and there might even be some cheering going on and a legacy that will go on forever for centuries. So last but not least, um, every good leader knows the importance of having the right team and family beside them. So we hope you'll enjoy this series, learn more about the industry's top leaders and what it takes. So let's jump right in. Today, we're gonna hear from Adrian Foley. He's the president and chief executive officer for Brookfield Properties Development Group for all of North America. He's officially the CEO as of January of this year. Adrian and the Brookfield team have over 80 active developments and over 55 million square feet in their future. Adrian is without a doubt, one of the most creative thinkers who is always pushing to do it better. And he will always motivate all around him to do the same. He's a great friend to me and to so many. He's a brilliant leader. And everyone who knows Adrian is inspired by his leadership. So please welcome today, Adrian Foley. Mr. Foley. Um, We're going to ask you a little bit, as you know, about you first as the man, and then we're going to go into some of the other parts and pieces. One of the best parts that I love about Adrian is when I told him he was uh, sort of our inaugural leader, he was uh, very modest about that. And and that's the part that's the coolest thing about Adrian. He's uh, he's more about the leadership and his people than he is about, uh, it's all about him. So we're going to dive right in. And I'm going to just start with a simple question, which is, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do all day long? Thanks, thanks, Molly. Uh, thanks for the nice intro. Um, so you mentioned I I, uh, I have a I have the title of President and COO of Brookfield Properties Development Group, uh, which is really uh, um, an incredibly talented fifteen hundred or so person team that spans uh, north the, the about twenty three North American markets um, where. Our group does um, Brookfield's ground up development uh, across its North American portfolio of real estate. So for, for the majority of, uh, of your, the audience here, um, they will relate that to our land and housing business, which is a master plan community business uh, that's in those 23 markets um, and a vertical for sale housing business that builds in um, in those master plan communities. Um, uh, what the audience may, may be less aware of is, uh, is a commercial development. I say commercial development, but really a multifamily income producing, uh, single family rental income producing, um, and office and retail mixed use development team 
that works on a variety of uh, of Brookville owned real estate uh, in in I'll say sort of key markets, core markets uh, in the U.S. Um, so you blend those two uh, teams and you get um, you get our development group at Brookville Properties. Nice, nice. Well, I want to talk a little bit about you and go way back. Uh, I sense a little bit of an accent there. <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of where you started and kind of where you grew up and, and how you got here, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, um, not that it's of much interest to anyone, anyone but I grew up in, in London, England. Uh, I was born just outside of England, uh, just outside of London. And uh, my father, who played uh, professional soccer, uh, football, um, uh, was transferred from team to team and he ended up getting transferred to London, uh, to a London team. And uh, at the age of about four, I, um, I, uh, I moved to London with my parents and, um, and grew up in and around London, uh, spent 23 more years. So I, by the time I was 27, 28, um, uh, I was heading to the US. Um, so I spent those first uh, 27, 28 years of my life uh, living in London. How long did your dad play soccer? How long did he play soccer? Uh-huh. My dad played soccer, actually, he was in the professional game from age nice. 16 to 66 and no way. Uh, so he was in the game uh for 60 years and excuse me 50 years and um uh had was very fortunate lived uh um lived his life uh, playing the game as a kid and uh and then got into it professionally and then made his way through playing managing and coaching or coaching and managing went back and forth uh, so he's very fortunate and um yeah he uh he he from him, uh, I have many of my own personal uh, uh, sort of attributes, as most as most uh, kids do of their parents, and my mother too. Um, I don't want to miss her, uh, miss out any of her value. But uh, sure. I got a number of, a number of attributes from my father uh, uh, through through competitive sports. So, did you play soccer? I did, and and um, uh, fortunately, I think never well enough to to play it professionally. I played semi professionally. From the age of 16 till about 27 when I left to come nice. to uh, America. But uh, at the age of 16, I was told that uh, it just wasn't going to be good enough. So uh, it was probably the worst day and the best day of my life uh, because I didn't know it then, but I, I, I was, I needed it. I needed the kick in the backside to go do something else. And something else was getting into the, the real estate business. I have to believe that is part of what inspires your competitive nature though today, right? Yeah, totally. It's, um, you know, I think about the the sort of work ethic traits that I have today, which um, I, I don't, I don't profess to brag about many things, but I, I would hold my personal work ethic up against most. Um, and that comes oh, totally, sure. totally from my, uh, from my upbringing. Uh, my father um, uh, grew up, as I mentioned, uh, actually left school when he was 15 and never did anything else but play soccer and just knew that that was his life, that was gonna be his life. Um, so he worked really hard at it. Um, and, and also the sort of team sport attributes that, um, uh, that I think flow into us as a business today at Brookfield, uh, I attribute to, uh, um, to my, my upbringing, my competitiveness um, uh, through sports, uh, but also the value that I place and we place uh, at Brookfield on, on team. It's not about, uh, I, it's about we, and uh, it's not about me, it's about we. So uh, it, it, it's really, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just very fortunate and you don't realize it um, as much, uh, frankly. Uh, you know that in order to win, you're gonna win as, as a team. Um, when you play sports in a team sports environment, as an individual, you, you, uh, you don't necessarily tran translate those uh, two things into business, those things into business. But it's really evident uh, today that it's very much a part of who I am. I agree. You know, I played a ton of sports. It's one of my main interview questions is, you know, just tell me. And it doesn't have to be sports per se, but like what kind of team did you play in growing up? Because I think that's such a huge part of this. Well, how did you get how did you get into home building? I mean, how did you get into land development? All the stuff you're doing. I can tell you in my own history with you uh, and my experience with you is you made a pretty quick, uh, you know, entry into our market for sure but but tell me how you got here 
Yeah, I, and again, I don't think this is a great interest, but I, I, I think it's only relevant for people to, as they're maturing in their own careers, to think about what are those things that drive them drive them internally? What are those mm -hmm. things they're passionate about? Mm -hmm. So I grew up as a kid, as I mentioned, left school when I was 16. And I realized I needed to get myself into a, into a, a real career. And I, I was really always in love with architecture. I was always in love with, with the word architect and, uh, and the notion of designing something. Um, I didn't ever wanted to spend the, the humongous amount of time and hours studying architecture. <laughs> uh, I wanted to take the, short, the shortcut, which is a bit of it was, it was a bit of my my uh, my own personal challenge, um, but I spent uh, I, I got a job at the Greater London Council in the Department of Architecture and Civic Design, nice. which which was effectively my entree into architecture because I would sit there, poring over plans and reviewing plans for for um, for permitting purposes for the Greater London Council, and I would go tour these amazing buildings. So I fell in love with the built environment and really buildings generally and I, I'm looking at your building that's behind you and and I I can describe each of the parts and pieces of that building today and I can dismantle it in my mind and know how it, how it gets put together so I I knew buildings and how buildings got put together when I came to the US so at, at the age of 22 23 I started a, a, a small development company with with a high net worth individual and I grew that for five or six years while I lived uh, while I lived in London and really got into everything from buying, uh, construction managing, selling, and financially modeling uh, the, de the, de the development space. When I came to the US, I was very fortunate. I, I got offered a job at Taylor Woodrow, uh, what is now Taylor, uh, Taylor Morrison, and, um, and met two incredibly talented individuals, Karina Hathaway and Jeff Proster. Nice. And, and just, you know, again, fortune, uh, uh, follows the brave or, or whatever the saying is, you know, I, I was brave in going to the US, but but really fortunate in that I fell into the hands of, of two incredibly gifted people. And, and as a result of that, kind of my, my, um, my op opportunity came to me to really play a part in, in developing new, new housing in Southern California. That that really unleashed, uh, uh, unleashed uh, uh, kind of a, a passion for architecture and design. So it it's it's full circle. I, I guess what I would say for any of any of the audience who's thinking about their own personal careers and whether they're 20 years of age or 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 50 years of age, whatever their their, their next stage in life is, um, that you know you, pursuing your passion and doing what you you frankly find quite easy to work hard at is really important. Um, I am in a job where I don't find it uh, hard to work hard. Because uh, I love what I do, it's never been work to me. So, um, long story short, uh, that was uh, that was how I, I got in, in the, into the development space. So I'm going to actually give a slightly different story than Adrian just gave. <clears throat> it was a little bigger than that. So, so he and uh, I'm going to call it this trio um, opened up, got together, designed this new community, opened up at probably one of the toughest in one of the toughest markets ever. Not only did this project, I mean, it was noteworthy everywhere. I mean, people came from all over to see it because it was so well done. But I think as I recall, Adrian, you shut the neighborhood across the street down. Like they had to close their models. Do you remember this? I do. And they had to start over because your project was so much better. And, and I would tell you, uh, it's a great example of design matters because man, did it make a statement and a difference and they sold at a premium when everybody thought it was about price, the details, the merchandising, the architecture. I mean, it was just so thoughtfully done. And it just completely, I think it was a conversion of, of new thought, new ideas, and it made us all just think about uh, home building in a whole new way. And I think it pushed us to a better place as an industry, at least certainly in Southern California. Um, it was, uh, you hit the ground running fast. Um, but let me ask you this, like, what was it about? Did you want to go into architecture or did you fall into that? Or when you were younger, like what brought you there? Uh, yeah, it was, it was, you know, uh, it was you know, need to feed myself uh, initially, get a job and, and uh, but sure. then realize, realize just gradually realizing that I really love, I really loved buildings. And, and, you know, I, I guess I would say, like, like I said, I would say to my own son who loves music, pursue something that's quote in the music business, even if you're, not going to make a career as a professional musician, um, totally. you know, do something associated with what you have a passion with. And I was at a passion for buildings 
and a passion for architecture. So if I could be involved somewhere in that business, that was gonna that was gonna make uh, me not feel like work was work, and and it and it never has. Um, so so that's what that's what sort of tripped me into uh, the space. And and what brought you over to the U.S.? I think I know the answer to this, but I just to confirm. Yeah, I met my wife uh, 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 on a beautiful night in October in 1987 in in London, and she was uh, in for five days vacation from Connecticut. And um, we decided that London wasn't where we should spend every rainy day of our lives. We should go somewhere where it's sunny. In California, uh, the flag popped up in California. So you have your own development company. You're completely established, and then you meet this cute girl, and you're like. I'm out. <laughs> I, uh, I'm and, across the world, and there I am. <laughs> and I said to my my mother at the airport, "I think I'll be back in a couple of years." And uh, <laughs> that, was, that was 31 years ago. Uh, but yeah, it's been uh, it, it's been incredible. Um, this is the most amazing country on the planet. So passionate about your business, passionate about the ones you love. I like it. It's awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about Brookfield. Um, you know. Why you've been at this company for a really long time, as you mentioned, you've worked at uh, other places and you've worked at great other places and um, and you you've made the crossover to Brookfield and you've been there for quite some time. You certainly have catapulted your career. Why Brookfield? What 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 is it about Brookfield that makes it uh, the place for you? Yeah, I, I think of it um, uh, sort of a couple of ways. One is, um, you know, uh, it's a company make, that makes me proud every day. Uh, to say uh, the name Brookfield, um, sure. uh, which uh, which not everybody has the ability to say, albeit I'm sure people feel proud of the company they're with. Um, uh, so on the one hand, I'm proud to say the name Brookfield, but on the other hand, more more um, more sort of fundamentally, it it speaks a very it speaks a language that I understand um, in in how it treats people, um, how it structures its organization. And treats others within its organization, um, how it uh, it empowers and delegates and 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 frankly, you know, holds people responsible for for what they do, as opposed to um, you know companies where where you know there's a saying called the hippo company, which is the high paid paid person's opinion counts. I <laughs> I, I I would not want to be at a company that does that. Um, I left a country that uh, lives very much on the basis of a class structure and and a and a, and a hierarchy a pyramid hierarchy um it offended me uh, uh when i was there because frankly because i i i didn't think i could compete um i didn't think it, it gave me the ability to succeed um and uh and i i think anyone in england resents you leaving the class you're in uh, and that may sound strange to any American, but it is interesting. Real, yeah, the reality is it's it's a it's it's steeped in your DNA and 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 how how you and your family grew up, and it matters more where your family went to school or where where you went to school or which part of town you lived in than than your work ethic or your opinions or the value that you create every day. So or I joined a company. Oh, your talent. Uh, so right. I joined a company, Brookfield, which which none of that. It exists and look yes we have incredibly smart people in the organization and and no one's saying for one moment that we don't want to give them the microphone when it's appropriate but uh, sure. but quite honestly uh, the company values uh, every part of the organization equally and says you know you're a critical piece in in our future so it speaks a language I really understand as I mentioned not just in that sense but also how it treats people. It's it's all about the long run of Brookfield. It's not about the near term win. You know, we want to compete just like everybody else does, and we will. And our elbows get up when we feel like someone's trying to push us around. But frankly, relationships and partnerships are all about the long run. We're not about pulling the last five dollars out out of your pocket today, um, and yeah, and no. thinking that's the only business we're going to do. It's pretty incredible. Uh, if you'd have told me. At, uh, with, uh, at the age of um, you know 22, when I was venturing off to build my my first development deal in London, uh, that at my age now I'd be a part of uh, you know the world's largest real estate company, um, developing some amazing real estate in the U.S., um, living in Southern California. I'd have told you you were absolutely nuts. Uh, the world's but, but largest real estate company. 
that's impressive. Yeah, it is. And it, and it doesn't that's mean impressive. we don't use that. We don't use that as a brag, a bragging tool. And that's not meant to sound like we're the world's largest, therefore the we're the world's smartest. It's meant to be just the scale of the organization is, is pretty wild. It's pretty impressive. No, that's pretty, that's a pretty wild statement to make. I, I don't think I even knew that. That's, that is impressive. Yeah. Was there a point in your career where you, where you just like, was there a moment, like a certain time where it was like, God, this is a pretty cool place to be. Like one moment that you're like, wow, I, I know I'm going to work here the rest of my life and not, you know, I don't want to like predict your entire future, but <laughs> I suspect, you know, given your success in your career there. The, the, I don't think there's necessarily one, one moment. It's, it's a series of moments. I think you, you, you always, I always feel like, um, uh, I need to be on a path of, of growth for myself personally. And I've always felt like um, I'm never, I'm never where I want to finish. And there's that next opportunity or that next uh, point of interest that's, uh, that's available. So I think that's a good, personally think that's a good trait. It does mean that you're never settled, you're never satisfied, you never relax. And, and Karina Hathaway would say, I'm exhausting um, because of that. Um, and, and, others, that. and others who are listening uh, to this will probably echo that same sentiment. I think, <laughs> I think you've, not, not, not my own exhausting, but, uh, but for themselves. But I do, think, um, I do think there are various stages where I, I reflected and said, oh my gosh, um, the acquisition of Playa Vista was uh, a development that uh, we had seen grow through the early 2000s. And in 2012, when we acquired it, I thought, oh my gosh, I never thought I'd be involved in these discussions. Um, but Brookfield acquired a development in London called Canary Wharf. I had seen Canary Wharf grow up as a kid. You know, growing up in London, it, it was two miles from where I lived. I'd seen this place get trans transformed in the early 80s. And here we were, I was, a, I was a part of the company. I knew the people who had acquired Canary Wharf. It was like, this is amazing. So awesome. um, it is pretty awesome. And then just recently, you know, the, the company, our development team completed a development in Nashville uh, on the corner of Fifth and Broadway that I, I would urge you and anyone to go see it. It's, it's, it's world-class. It's I've got to get piece, out there. It's an amazing piece of real estate. And I, I went through it and said, oh my gosh, the team that I'm, I'm a part of built this. It's, it's pretty incredible. So no, 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 no time have I ever thought like, oh, wow, I've made it or, or this is it at all, because that's never a mindset uh, for me, but uh, and shouldn't be, I don't think for anyone. Um, but uh, uh, those are some pretty key points of saying, wow, can it get much better than this? Well, I think we I think we have an opportunity that's unique uh, in uh, in the real estate spectrum, especially as it relates to um, uh, to where people live where people work and where people choose to play or, or be entertained. Um, and I associate entertaining with shopping and or, you know, with retail activities and or, uh, uh, and or hoteling, um, that Brookfield has uh, the ability to touch um, each part of, uh, of, of your everyday uh, life. Um, in the living world, we can clearly um, telegraph for you how Brookfield can partner with you through your living experience. And whether that's um, the student housing dorm that you, uh, you rent when you go to college, to your, your first multifamily uh, rental home, to your single family rental um, uh, uh, detached home, to your first for sale home, to your active adult home, et cetera, that we can really create an environment where there's real value for you to partner with Brookfield through that experience. Um, the, the, your evolution um, is our opportunity to provide service, goods and services to you along that way. And I think that's so unique. There are a few companies out there who can do that. Um, right, right, but, full circle. Yeah, full circle. But I, I, I don't think anyone's mastered it. And I think, I think the scale of our organization, both, both where we operate and, and the portfolio of, of offerings that we have, makes it really viable for us to think that if you live in Southern California, or if you live in, in Austin, Texas, or if you live, pick a place in the US, that there's, there's a, there is a ton of opportunity for Brookfield to engage the living opportunity for you. So, so what, what we would hope that you think when you think about Brookfield is you think about them as a living partner and not just for this one house or this one rental uh, unit that you're transacting with us today that 
that were one and done, that that long-term relationship that I mentioned we're proud of in our business dealings uh, translates to you as a, as, a, as a residential living customer. And that you can really see yourself, um, as I mentioned, kind of on that, on that journey with Brookfield. And, and let me ask you this, why though in that whole experience, what makes Brookfield different in that experience? I, I get the whole circle of amenities and the, all those parts and pieces. Um, but is there something very specific? And, and I know we've talked a lot of different ways about how you would kind of not only just serve the customer, but almost be a partner to the customer. But, but how is that really different than say, you know, I don't want to mention another builder per se, but like, let's pick any of the builders out there. What, yeah. makes, what makes it so different? Because well, it is think, different. You have to experience it. Yes. Yeah. And I, and I think, by the way, I think this is where we think our industry needs to go to or will go to. Uh, and the consumer will see value in this rather than the single onesie twosie transactions that they have with for sale builders mm -hmm. um, that ultimately we've got to create this customer for life environment um, where every one of those transactions that that customer engages in during their life, we have the ability to reduce that layer of cost. Um, and, and I bring in just the rental and the active adult and the senior housing components just as, a, as an extension of the first right. sale experience. But when you add up through your life what you spend on those transactions, it's colossal. And actually having an environment where it was easier, frictionless for you to go in and out of homes, whatever, your, whatever that journey is, and where you didn't pay five and a half, six percent every time you wanted to trade in and out of a home. You know, the, the iBuyer process is definitely doing a great job of removing the, the obscurity and creating more transparency about that process. We think as builders and as Brookfield, we need to lean in on that exercise as well. Um, but if you can look at compressing these layers across the, uh, through, the, uh, through your life experience of living um, and have a partner that you trust, that you know isn't just dealing with you on this one transaction and then, and then you know, never interested in seeing you ever again. Um, that's going to transform your choice, and you won't just buy that home singularly for its location or singularly for its price. That'll still be a big component, but you'll actually care about who's built it, or who's or who the landlord is, or who the you know future provider of of home might be. You'll actually seek that builder out when you go to your new markets if you're moving from A to B. Um, and it's hugely beneficial to you and it's hugely beneficial to us. We spend seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 per customer today. It's wow. a colossal amount of money. And, and add to that, that you're spending that every time you sell or more every time you sell your home. So, you know, we want to lower those, the friction and lower the cost of, of, uh, of those transaction layers. So, so we can really make your life um, more pleasurable and, and your experience of living more enjoyable. I'm proud of the fact, and there are a few other builders who have done this, that we've recently launched uh, uh, our website um, uh, with full transparency on pricing um, and, and how the pricing relates to other prices in the neighborhood that you're buying in. How about that? Like That's huge. That I a, mean, I know I, I hate the whole like game playing thing. Like just it's, tell me the price. It's 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 <sighs> been, I mean, and actually you you mentioned other industries, you know, the auto industry I think has done a great job of gradually yes. re, re, come removing, a long way. Come a oh, long way. Sure. And thanks to yeah. companies like Tesla and others out there who have really said this is a miserable way to do business. And frankly, yeah, like, like we don't really that's not really where we make our money. Like, Brainer was make, great about that too. The price is the price. Like exactly. we're not gonna haggle. Like here it is. So, so really creating an environment where, where the, the price of that home that we've arrived at, we share that logic with you, that actually you can buy that home online. Taylor Woodrow is doing this today and other, other builders are doing this. Paul Tia has a little bit of a sample example of this uh, in operation. We want to get the, the industry to the point where you can buy now and there's full transparency. And, and not to suggest that brokers aren't important and they don't play a role, because they do. We've talked quite, a lot about that, yeah. But, but quite frankly, this is not where their highest and best use is. We should be able to provide that broker advocacy uh, to you as a consumer by providing you with the information on this is, these are the last 60 sales we've made this year. Why do you need any more advocacy than that? So 
um, anyway, so it's really changing that experience, um, creating an environment where once we do, once you do buy the home from us, we're, we're available to you to recertify that home when you want to sell it, even if you don't want to buy one of ours, but hopefully you want to buy one of ours. And if you want to buy one of ours, man, there's a whole bunch of layers of cost in there that we can help compress, as I mentioned a minute ago. So really re-engineering this whole experience. Um, and there's a, there's a few builders, ourselves included, that are on this bandwagon of really trying to change how our industry does it. And uh, I think it's, it's akin to the car industry where you had that sort of um, car salesman uh, negative connotation where today there's a little more um, honesty, transparency, and openness with that with that uh, with that that transaction. So we hope to do the same. When I, I think some of the things that you've shared with me in the past is that whole role or that whole human touch component is is incrementally so important to the process. Where we're going to spend it in the categories where it, it counts and where it makes sense. And so it's it's really sort of a transition of the role of that player is more of a concierge and an experience expert as opposed to like you know weeding through paper to get to your answer because it's so organized and easy to do today why not make it better so um so i agree with you the salesperson doesn't go away they just transform into a better place what about the opportunity to actually uh grow with my home and trade my home in and as my family grows i grow in the brookfield family and as my family leaves, I change in the Brookfield family of home types and choices. I mean, that just, I mean, those are some of the things that we've tried. I just think that's brilliant. Like I would never buy another house from another builder again with that concept. It's a natural evolution. The only, the only shortcoming is, is that we aren't always where you want to be. So we've got, we've got to deal with that, the reality of that. But obviously in, in, in a, in a lot of situations, we are going to be where you want to be. And especially as it relates to your expanding family, your family transitioning to a Brookfield student house, multifamily home, single family rental home or first home uh, for sale is, I mean, the opportunity is, is phenomenal. So um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's really uh, allowing us to have these conversations and, 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 and opening up the mind of our own team, uh, frankly, to sort of transform uh, the conversation around single transactions to lifelong experiences. That's pretty cool. Well, let's, we're going to, uh, as we're sort of wrapping up here, as we talk about sort of in your life, inspirational leaders, um, share with, share with the audience, who are your top, maybe two inspirational leaders out there and share a few characteristics of each that you've admired in, in one or two of your inspirational leaders. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll go back to um, one of my British brethren, Richard Branson, um, <laughs> who I had the good fortune of meeting uh, almost like month one when I moved out here in in, in so 19, fun. Of course, you met Richard Branson month one. I, I, I don't I, I don't want to say I'm on first name <laughs> terms, but uh, but I did get the pleasure of meeting <laughs> only him, uh, only Adrian. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> but uh, but Richard Branson struck me uh, as. Um, actually actually spoke to me similarly to the way Brookfield speaks to me. You know, he didn't come out of school as a phenomenally educated individual. He did, did grow up with a couple of shillings in his pocket, which I, I, I didn't, I wasn't short of money, but I didn't have as much as he did. But he, he left school really relatively uneducated and, uh, and is, is very much uh, self-driven. Um, but, but that's part of what I love about Richard Branson. The other part is, you know, he, he definitely always has a smile on his face, which I, I try, I try to do that on a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. He's the ultimate guy who's pursued, pursued his passion. And, and frankly, has probably never worked a day in his life as a result. But brave, innovative, creative, a bit wacky. Um, you know, there's certain decisions that he's made that I definitely wouldn't have made. Uh, balloon riding, uh, a balloon flying across the, the globe being one. Um, but look, <laughs> he, he is just, he epitomizes the energy that you want to see in a, in a leader, which is the whole point of this chat, the energy you want to see in a leader that, that, that makes you do what you don't think you're capable of doing. And that's right. ultimately what we're all about, right? We all want to be pushed to do things. I have on my desk, it, it's, a, it's a Bob White, my good friend Bob White bought me this. It says, what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? We all want to feel like we have the ability to do something we, don't, we aren't going to fail and they'll give you the confidence. So Richard Branson, to me, 
epitomize that. He's been phenomenally successful. We, we all know the stories. Um, but I think he 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 just he just he made me want to um, be be like him. Uh, That's so then awesome. The other, and then silly. the other side. Yeah, he's a passionate guy for sure. Totally, totally. And it, and he and he's frankly, age is not a number. Is it's purely a number for him. He's like he's just as passionate today as he is when he was in his twenties. Um, That's awesome. The uh, the other would be a guy called Mark Benehoff, who who probably your audience, you know, Mark uh, uh, runs Salesforce, and and for a number of reasons. Uh, but I think probably at its core, his leadership style within Salesforce. Um, imparts a certain tone and a, and a, and a certain, um, uh, as a company, a leadership uh, uh, style for, for industries to follow, whether it's how, how they treat with diversity, uh, um, you know, uh, successful women in their business, uh, their role in the community and what, and what they do to give back. Um, you know, I always, I always go uh, uh, to Salesforce to steal their their protocols for how they're handling the pandemic, how they're dealing with oh, vaccinations, really? how they're dealing with women in the workplace, how they're dealing with diversity, equity, and belonging. I, I, think, cool. I think as a company, they are a, they're a really high watermark uh, for, for companies to follow. Now, they're, they're, they've got some, some of their challenges too, uh, but Mark yeah. himself, I follow him on Twitter. He's a, I'm, a, I'm an avid Twitter follower of people like him. I learn a lot from uh, from the Mark Benhoffs of the world. Well, I, I think of Mark as a community builder in all things, right? So mm -hmm. that's really what Salesforce is all about, right? Oh, and yeah. uh, you know, and as it relates to Richard Branson, what I love about him is, is, so I have a fear of failing, but I have a fear of not trying things with the idea that I could fail, right? So, so you have to really push yourself to. To still, you know, be competitive, but also kind of push beyond that and say, you know, if I fail, I get up and I get up again, right? Yeah. The next day, and I you know, fight another day, right? So, um, totally. and he definitely is a like, whoops, okay, let's keep going. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, if you were to pick up all the things we talked about, I mean, we talked about your parents, we talked about your mom, your dad, all you know, you know, starting out, certainly meeting your wife, you know, coming all the way to the other side of the country top leaders. Um, I know you have so many people in your organization that you admire um, within the organization, but if, if you were to pick sort of the top three qualities as you're sharing with other leaders, you know, people starting out in our industry, uh, people that are thinking about a work field, all those things, you know, what are the three kind of core values or things that you think uh, are really inspirational ways to look at leadership. Yeah, I, I have such great role models at Brookfield. Um, you know, Bruce Flatt, the, yeah, the chief awesome. executive officer of Brookfield Asset Management is the ultimate um, uh, sort of guiding guiding uh, 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 light for our organization, but, but definitely Im uh, uh, imparts these principles. Uh, Brian Kingston, who runs a real estate business across the, uh, across the globe, um, just incredibly intelligent, thoughtful individual also has them. And then more locally, my friend, Alan Norris, um, who's the CEO of uh, Brookfield Properties Development, um, all I think embody these sort of three traits that um, we don't speak about, um, but are just evident. Um, uh, and one's humility, you've mentioned it. Uh, you know, I think oh, really? it's, it's at its core at Brookfield. Uh, at the moment you think it's all about you this is not the place for you um <laughs> and uh totally and uh, and those that come into this company and and struggle with that frankly don't last very long mm. um so humility uh, and it's because of all the reasons we talked about it's because it keeps you it keeps you in check look we've all got egos we've all got we're all proud of what we do and passionate because that's the second but um but we're we're not we're checking it we're we're checking it at the door and uh, we're going to work together as a team. So humility for each of those three. Um, the second passion, um, you, you know, I don't I don't know what the saying is, but it goes something like I don't think you can do anything successfully without being passionate um, oh. uh, about it. Um, so each one of those three, you know, Bruce Flat just the most excited man on the planet when you're talking about a, a piece of real estate that's new and that's going to be developed and that we're going to do financially quite well at just incredible. And Brian Kingston, the same Alan Norris, just really passionate about our business 
and about people and um and just enjoy engaging and being a part of uh of a team so passionate individuals and then the last is is community you know i think about the community of uh, uh of places that we build and create um i think about the community uh of our teams of our local teams and i think about the community of our organization and uh they make it a community you know i've, I've always said this is as big as Brookfield has gotten, and it's a big company, it still feels like a, a small company to me. It still feels like you could literally, you know, pick up the phone anymore because none of us do, but you could text or you could email or you could you could definitely email any one of those three individuals and they'd be back at you. Anyone in our company, they'd be back at you within 15 to 20 minutes. It just feels like a small company. That is what community feels like. I'm not a number here. You're not a number at Brookfield. You're not a number at Zonda. Molly Carmichael's just as critical as as the as the next person uh so it just feels like a community and uh, those three i think are things that you know make me uh connect all the dots of brookville well i i, I think those are three perfect qualities and an inspirational leader so with that i i actually want to thank you for joining us today i'm so appreciative of your time and, and I would just say of those three qualities, I don't think I could pick three better qualities to align with you and certainly the whole team at Brookfield. I mean, the understated nature, but have a great time doing it. Uh, passion shows up not just in working with your teams, but certainly in the homes and communities you build. Uh, and the community part of it speaks for itself. I mean, you can see it throughout the country and as the largest, um, you know, a residential landholder in the country and in the world. I mean, that is, I think that's who's for itself. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And again, I really appreciate your time. And I hope you all enjoyed today's conversation with Adrian Foley. Uh, and we hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks, Adrian. Have a Thanks great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.